Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo, più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli, perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo, più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli, perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli.
la civiltà dell'amore. Fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for being here today. There's so many people with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here with us. There's so many people today. This is part of the Inexhaustible Friendships series, and this is about Don Pino Pugliesi, the testimony of martyrdom. And I want to say hello to all the people connected following this session online. I would also like to make a few introductory remarks, starting with a personal memory, that is the last uh, meeting by chance with uh, Father Pugliesi in 1993 in Palermo in July, two months before his martyrdom. That was uh, a meeting we had by chance in Piazzetta Settangeli uh, next to the Cathedral of Palermo. We exchanged uh, a few remarks uh, about the recent events and then we said goodbye, and I could uh, see his usual smile, that smile that made so much news in the years to come. But I would like to say right from the start that uh, this smile is not a literary genre. It is not about uh, a literary memoir. That smile had uh, a very strong strength, and the Mafia people of Brancaccio realized that, which was why they picked him as a target at a time when in Palermo four priests of the diocese of Palermo that were considered exposed to the Mafia threat uh, used to move around uh, with bodyguards. But the Mafia people of Brancaccio picked another target. And why? Because in that smile and in the event that originated from that smile, there was much, much more that could be understood and appreciated. As Mario Luzzi warned in his poem, strong with his uh, knowledge about Palermo and in his extraordinary work of theater and poetry, The Flower of Pain, dedicated to the martyrdom of Father Pugliesi. In this work, uh, the profoundness and the richness of that smile had already been uh, shown. So this afternoon's session is an attempt and even a precious opportunity to go deeper into the current power and in the strength of this smile. And as Pope Francis said in his message to the Church of Palermo, and then the Archbishop will talk about this for the 30 years from the martyrdom of Father Pugliesi. It is a smile that gets to us as a gentle light that digs inside and illuminates uh, the heart. In 
in this dialogue, in this session today, we have three guests I would like to thank on behalf of the meeting as they accepted our invitation with enthusiasm and availability. First of all, His Excellency Monsignor Corrado Lorefice, Archbishop of Palermo. Honestly, he prefers to be called uh, Father Corrado, but that, uh, that's the way that I should have introduced him. Then Mr. Antonio Balsamo, magistrate, uh, he is in the Court of Cassation at the moment. And Mr. Vincenzo Morgante, who is a popular figure in uh, TV Rai in Sicily. He's been director of many boardrooms in uh, Rai, and today he's here as director of TV 2000 channel. Before opening today's dialogue, as I will give the floor to Vincenzo, who will play a twofold role. He is a, a witness of those years and he will also serve as a moderator. We will watch a short video made by Gabriela Ricotta, journalist by the TV One station, and I thank them for giving us the right to use this uh, uh, video, where some questions are asked to the living brother of Father Puglisi. In your opinion, the narration that is done today of Father Pino correspond to the figure of your brother, really, or in the journalistic narrative, in the celebration of the blessed, uh, sometimes we betray what was the real personality of Father Pino? Well, Father Pino is uh, often judged uh, by the media as the so-called anti-mafia priest, which is not true. He was not anti, he was pro. He tried to take to the right path the guys and even the children of these mafia people. So the description that is made of him is not accurate, it's different. He was a priest and above all, he tried to teach young people how to free themselves from the mafia game, and that's all. This bothered the mafia people, and this led to his killing. Do you ever pray to your brother? Well, sometimes, yes, when I need to. And then, when I have some difficulty, I always think and uh, wonder what he would do in such and such circumstance, and I try to follow suit but a normal person. Today there is the idea that holiness and the saint is like a superhero. Instead, Father Pino was a simple person, right? But for us, for me, uh, he was my brother, for my wife, uh, brother-in-law, for my children and uncle. For us, he was a normal person. That's it. And once I was asked in an interview when we noticed uh, that we had a saint in the family. And I said, well, we never noticed because for us, he was just like that. And for us, it was normal like that. Maybe we realized the difference with the other priests when he was no longer there. Basically, we saw that he was a different priest. Echo. Starting from uh, this opening, Vincenzo, now you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks to you all, friends for being so numerous in this session. And uh, I can assure you that you won't regret among the, all the sessions that are being offered at the same time this afternoon, you won't regret for coming here, along with uh, the Archbishop of Palermo, the Magistrate and uh, Mr. Talmina. We will have the chance to discover and rediscover an extraordinary figure of a priest and of a citizen. A mild man, a firm person, determined person, 
in love with his role of Presbyterian, of his life, and of the flock that the Lord entrusted him with. I was asked to expand a little bit and not just to moderate this session, but also to say something of my testimony. And I will get emotional for sure because the four of us on this stage today, we are all linked to Father Pugliese. Uh, we are all friends. I uh, was a, a peer at the University of Mr. Tarmina and President Balsamo. And I'm also friend to my archive shop. Uh, I now live in Rome, but I'm still a citizen of Palermo. So Monsignor Corrado Lorefice is my pastor. And we are all linked also for the fact that uh, the four of us knew Father 3P, Pino Pugliese. I knew him, first of all, through the uh, memories of my spouse, who was a, a student at the high school where Padre Pugliese, not Father Pugliese, used to work. And he, she told me about this figure of professor of a priest that he was so careful and so committed. She told me about uh, the meetings, the classes that uh, with uh, his uh, students he used to organize outside the school environment. These meetings were spiritual exercises and uh, they were also meant uh, to involve uh, confession. But those meetings were organized in very small places. So a confession was done in a very small car, a 500 maybe car of Padre Pugliese, Father Pugliese. He was really a simple, poor man. And uh, the seat or the passenger side where the person being confessed had to sit was broken. So during confession, this seat would uh, turn back with the move backward and uh, everybody would start laughing, including Father Pugliese. I'm, I'm saying this just, be, just to mention the simplicity, which is not lack of attention, but there was really a great focus on each and every interlocutor. Then when I was a fiancé, I had a relationship and I had the chance uh, to meet Father Pugliese at the house of my mother and brother-in-law. Uh, my uh, father-in-law was present in the parish, it was very active, and organized an evening to collect uh, some money to uh, create a center at the Brancaccio area. He invited many people, and there was a lottery, and there were those tickets with numbers that were sold and money was collected. And at that time I was working as an intern at the Rai in Palermo and Father Pugliese talked to me about the Brancaccio neighborhood that was known for the bad news that uh, was relevant to that. And he invited me to go and see him there. And a few days after, I, I mentioned that, that uh, I knew I got to know this uh, priest in a difficult neighborhood of Palermo. I mentioned that to my superiors at the Rai, and uh, my colleague said, come on, Morgante, you're always with priests. Come on, leave, leave us alone. And so they said no. But after a few months, a Sunday afternoon, the football league was finished, and the deputy director that was on duty there said, we have a TV troupe available for a couple of hours. What could we do? And I said, well, I, pro I proposed a couple of months ago an interview to Father Pugliese at the Brancaccio area. Should we do it? So I was given two hours of, availab of availability, and I could go there, and I could find him. I have to confess that such interview really marked my professional background. As Father Pugliese's father mentioned, Father Pugliese didn't really like uh, 
to be so visible and having to be interviewed uh, was a bit of a hassle for him but uh, I did discover then that he was being so much intimidated and he was being so much threat threatened by the Graviano family members there uh, that were really really heavy heavy atmosphere but uh, with great simplicity and with the smile that Salvatore mentioned, he showed me the areas that uh, were made available by the contribution of uh, the Archbishop uh, Cardinal Papalardo. They were being renovated, some uh, rooms there, some facilities, and I didn't see much really. We had the interview in front of uh, the warehouses of uh, a company and uh, they were sort of uh, underground warehouses where violent activities were going on, there were fights of uh, white dogs uh, for gambling, so there was a lot of expression there of uh, degradation of s social problems. And we were having the interview there and uh, at some point I saw um, light blue bell and that was put in a place to announce the birth of a baby and so I said to Father Pugliese a baby was born there uh, what can we tell this baby and basically and briefly he was able to summarize what his commitment was about overall, that is, the proximity made of love, attention and tenderness, but also of determination. We must tell that baby that there is a place in the world for him or her too, in freedom and in law. I went back to my office, I was really happy, but something was missing. The morning of the 16th of September 1993, I was listening to the radio news of Sicily, the Gazzettino. I was with my wife, that's the radio news of the Rai in Sicily, announcing the death of a priest the night before in the Brancaccio neighborhood. Uh, we immediately understood that it was about Father Pugliese, so I called the editor in chief and uh, I said, well, we have the interview from that priest, that's the man. And my wife was pregnant and uh, she went to the funeral. She entrusted the baby in to the Father Pugliese spirit and after a short time he was beatified. So in my professional and in my private life too, this figure really marked something really important. We will keep talking about him, but I would like to give the floor to the Archip Shop and to Mr. Balsamo. And as uh, Salvatore said, I would like to also to ask you if you remember your first and last meeting with uh, Father Pino. Monsignor, you have the floor. Well, yes, the narration is really effective to express uh, what we'd like to say in this session. The first meeting I had was when I was a priest. It was just a year I had been ordered and uh, the bishop uh, gave me the task of the vocational pastoral in uh, 1988, uh, Don Father Pino was the director of the Regional Center for Vocations. And uh, talking about friendship, I remember that the first uh, meeting came due to a meeting in Acireale in Perla Ionica. You are familiar with uh, what I'm talking about, uh, uh, this person. Agostina, who accompanied him, not just in the vocational pastoral activities, but also other social workers in an institute uh, that uh, 
was wanted by a cardinal from Palermo, and this person was the secretary at that time of the vocational center for the diocese of Palermo. And this person introduced me to Father Pino. And uh, she said, uh, uh, look, look at uh, how nice this young priest is. I was 26 years old and uh, I remember this uh, embrace I received. And especially I remember this first meeting in terms of his smile that I can assure that he it was really, really authentic. And then the last time I met him was in 1990. Cardinal Salvatore Papalardo, my blessed predecessor, was looking for a priest for the Brancaccio area. And uh, some other brothers in the confraternity of Father Pino said no. So Brancaccio was running the risk of remaining without a, a so-called pastor and the cardinal called him and he accepted. And I remember the last meeting of the regional center for vocations. We were in Pergusa and uh, Father Pino received uh, the appointment and just came to say goodbye. And uh, as I said, it was 1990. I, we told him, you can stay, you can combine the two services, you can be the um, father of the Brancaccio area, but you can keep your position as director, you have experience, you are known by everyone, you're known in Rome because he was also a national councillor. And uh, with his uh, great simplicity and serenity, which is also linked to his uh, decision-making capacity and strength, and without any possibility to appeal this, he said, that parish will commit me so much that they can't combine two services. And none of us could really reply, could really go against uh, his firm decision. And that's the memory that uh, is uh, still with me, that you have asked me to share and then I became director of the regional center of vocations and in 2015 a priest of Modica became archbishop of the diocese that has a beautiful wonderful priest like this one Presidente Balsamo. President Balsamo. To me as well, the smile of Father Pugliesi is a very strong memory, and I'm happy to share this memory with you. This smile really became part of my heart. I remember that in the mid ages we used to meet in Palermo, but also in the surrounding villages. And uh, that was part of, uh, I mean, the sort of uh, pathway of development of Azione Cattolica, of uh, uh, the Catholic action. And uh, I remember that we had summer camps and uh, Father Pugliesi was able to establish an authentic dialogue based on a mutual uh, trust and friendship. He had such a great empathy and uh, you loved the, the author, the American author Carl Rogers, and he was able to carry out his theory about empathy. And uh, he was able to understand them deeply, and uh, he helped them and encouraged them to better understand themselves. And uh, he was really able to set on an equal foot with them. And um, he was able also to persuade them to engage in society. And I remember that uh, there were other people in Palermo at that time that were able to use Christian values uh, to build hope. 
One was Piaxanti Mattarella, the president of the region, and the other one was Cardinal Salvatore Papalardo, another two key figures. At that time, the Christian message in Palermo becomes the awakening of uh, you know, the, the conscience of the Sicilian people and of all Italians at large. So it's a groundbreaking message relying on Christian values. That is a powerful message to somehow try to demolish the roots of the mafia organizations. He is not a judgmental person, Father Pugliesi. He really wants to do something good and concrete for society. And he thought, as Carlo Dalla Chiesa thought, that he needed to persuade people about the need to fight against mafia. When he goes to Brancaccio, he addresses the people in prison, in particular the people in the Ucciardone prison. And he says to the convicted, dear friends of the Brancaccio neighborhood, now you are being convicted in, uh, the, in this prison, but I'm thinking about you during this Christmas, and we wait for you at the Padre Nostro Center. So he conveys the weight of institutions and of the church in the neighborhood that was absolutely ruled by the mafia organizations. And this is a key moment. This is a key moment at that time, so uh, the mafia decides uh, to fight against the church, and uh, his murder is preceded by the speech by John Paul II on May the 9th, 1993, in Agrigento. It's a, a cry of uh, pride and hope. And the second key moment is July 28th against uh, San Giovanni Laterano and San Giorgio del Labro. And uh, the Claviano brothers, were acknowledged as uh, the guilty ones, and they were the bosses, the mobs of the Brancaccio neighborhood. And uh, Don Father Pugliesi is a target of Cosa Nostra because uh, it was considered as uh, a trigger of uh, social rehabilitation of the civil society in that neighborhood. And this is the same work that Piersanti Mattarella and Salvatore Papalado had had started, and so they were really destroying the laying foundations of the mafia organizations. And so his smile was extremely powerful, was a revolutionary smile. And I remember that very clearly, even uh, when I met him for the last time uh, in front of the Instituto delle Ancelle del Sacro Cuore. And I knew that that person was a real friend to me. On September the 15, 1993, when I got to know uh, about his death, I was so, so devastated. And I will always keep that smile in my heart. President Balsamo. You President Balsamo. I would really like to continue and use the smile as Phil Rouge. And uh, Father Pino is murdered in the evening of uh, September 15th, 1993. It's uh, his 50th birthday, and it was about to join a party for him. And. Graviano brothers decided to murder him. The mobs of the Brancaccio neighborhood, they were part, I mean, of organizations whose references were Totorina and Bagarella. And they had accumulated so much wealth thanks to uh, deal trafficking and uh, other crimes. 
and two people are enrolled to carry out uh, this murder. Gaspari Spatuzza and Salvatore Grigoli are enrolled to carry out this murder. And these two people will repent, but at different times. First Grigoli and then Spatuzza. And they said, and they said it themselves, that when they approach him with the guns, Father Pugliesi smiles at them, saying, I was expecting you. I was expecting this. President Balsamo was part of very delicate trials, including the one for the Capace attack, for the Via D'Amelio attack, the murder of the journalist Mario Francese, and also the trial of, at Bernardo Provenzano. So, President Balsamo, you find uh, to smile again during during the trials and uh, in the documentation of the trials. How? Well, I felt uh, the presence of Father Dino Pugliesi next to me while I was working at the Capace trial. And uh, at that time, we heard also the people who had murdered the father Pugliesi, Gaspari Spatuzzi and Salvatore Grigoli. We heard them because of the Capaci bombing trial. I will never forget what they said in their words. Salvatore Grigoli said at the beginning, I killed the saint, and I will never ever forget the expression on his face at that moment. And uh, Spatuzza says, I've started collaborating with Justice in 2008, after a mass. And there were so many references to Father Bullis' words. And one, for instance, was that the Lord never forces the heart of a person. When the heart is ready to be open, it will open up to God's message. And that message was uh, deeply understood by Spatuzza after 14 years, sorry, after 11 years. And he said, these 11 years uh, were key to me. And uh, those 11 years were fundamental for me, 11 years in rigorous imprisonment. They, he said that those 11 years were holy to him. And then there is the description of uh, the moment when he meets his assassins. And he was about to join a party, a birthday party for him. And then he sees uh, these two people in front of him. and. Uh, he goes towards them with his beautiful smile and said, I was expecting this. And that smile has become the symbol of courage for Palermo. Father Corrado, we said it in the beginning. Father Pugliesi would have never had accepted the definition of being a priest against the mafia. He didn't want to be against anything because he was in favor of life, of hope, of mercy, of gospel. He was a son of the council, and you said it several times. The role of played by priests at local level the role played by parishes is something that uh, makes us better understand the extent of the challenge 
to mafia organizations, but also to other things. And you really worked on education. You really wanted to involve the children and their families to encourage them to say no, to say no, because otherwise uh, those little favors would have come uh, permanent uh, constraints vis-a-vis -vis the mafia. And it were, he knew that uh, we need uh, to build up community centers. We should never ever expect anything from the mafia people. It's a message that it's still valid today, even if today there are fewer murders, fewer gunshots and shootings, but crime is still there and not just in Palermo and not just in the south of Italy. And I think that unfortunately we all know that. Well, in Palermo, young people die because of crack because of uh, drug dealing, drug trafficking, especially latest generation drugs like crack. But I'd like to keep uh, telling my story. When I first went uh, to see Father Pino at the cemetery, I found uh, a quote by John 15:13, and uh, there is no greater love than this, uh, giving your life for your friends. And then I found the same phrase on the grave of Monsignor Romero, and he is a saint as well today. And uh, after that long uh, trip. Uh, and uh, I remember that I was brought to the grave and I was struck by the fact that on the grave of uh, Father Romero, I found the very same quote that uh, I had found before on uh, Father Pino's grave. So greater love as no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then I remember that in Congo, on the graves of some killed missionaries, I found the very same John 15, 13 quote, the greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you just heard the, the words of uh, Father Pino and is the messenger of this uh, announcement. My brother was uh, a Christian priest, so you can't understand him fully without a strong sense of belonging to that person carrying the name of Messiah. So it was a Messiah-like life completely compensating for the lives of the men and women that are assigned to him because of his being a priest. And uh, he had uh, an adult vocation because uh, he oh, started his vocation when he was 16 and not 10 years old. And he had decided to, to study because basically to st it was an educator. He wanted to work uh, with educational activities. He was able to take out the best of people, of young minds. And to him, the key message was understanding who is Christ. Christ is the Messiah taking on his shoulders the pain of the others. So this is about communion, and communion becomes a, a possibility of, uh, uh, of being saved. And so that was to him the key message. So believe me, that's what he thought, that's what he believed in. He trained before the council. And I remember that there were many, many sort of complex speeches, and uh, there was a, a great preparation 
and uh, so there was this holy vision of the priest and that before entering the seminary before the homily and because the priest was seen as a, a powerful figure because also of uh, the power of uh, Eucharist then Father Pulisi somehow absorbs the spirit and the essence of uh, Council Vatican II. Uh, he knew what he was about to become, but he understood that uh, the gospel had to incarnate in the concrete life of the people of God since the very beginning, since Godrano in 1970. That was another mountain village with feuds between and among mafia families with assassinations, killings. And it brings to school the girls of this village who go to Palermo to study, even women. And he persuades their parents to let them go and get a diploma. And uh, during those years, he worked in those mountain villages. But then at the end, he worked, uh, I mean, on the seafront. And uh, but he was the same person. And you, and then he recalled that he was called back to from that person who had come uh, to take on his shoulders the pain of man. And uh, Pino Pugliesi embodies the essence of the gospel. We are following Jesus, who is the Messiah. And uh, so this is the story of uh, of the way evil can be somehow redeemed. And he knew that it was important to work on education, to educate and train young people. And he did everything he could to, to create an education center. He wanted a, a junior high school. He wanted a community center. It was really the essence of the local community. And um, this is a figure that we can understand only if we consider that uh, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And this is essential to understand his strength as a priest against the mafia. And But his intention was simply to be a, a Christian who, who was also a priest. Father Corrado, I would like to insist on this commitment by the church, by the priests, by the church community, the so-called Christian resistance to violence, to what is illegal, to mafia. As we said, the bosses of mafia have been uh, arrested thanks to the great work by uh, many police officers, educators, journalists, magistrates, judges. But there are new forms and shapes uh, taken by mafia, more refined uh, forms and shapes. Uh, this is still an issue. And so we need to reaffirm with the uh, strength the total and complete incompatibility between the gospel and the mafia, between the gospel and uh, the lack of uh, 
what is legitimate. And uh, we will never forget the homilies of Cardinal Papalardo on the occasion of uh, so many murders. Some were famous, others less famous ones. So, so much pain occurred in Palermo. I remember that we had uh, a period with three, four murders a day. The president of the region was killed, the mayor, the head of police, uh, the public prosecutor. So, Kinichi, the head of uh, inst instructor judges, so many police officers and judges and magistrates, so many you know, ordinary people died. But in spite of all of that, there is something that still calls on our attention. We have heard about the rape of a 19 years old, and this crime was perpetrated by a group of young people. And uh, I tried uh, to understand the pain of her parents, but also the pain uh, of the parents of these young uh, boys. I think that the church should commit even more and in a deeper way. Well, from this point of view, I think that there is a certain level of continuity, especially from uh, Pope John Paul II uh, down to Pope Francis. And uh, we recently got a letter published also on uh, the Vatican website, uh, on uh, the website of the uh, Palermo Archdiocese, because this year we have uh, we are celebrating uh, on September 15th, the 30th anniversary of his assassination. And uh, there is a specific word that we need to understand. The church, our communities, and the disciples of God had the chance to meet the Messiah, the Messiah of their lives. And Eucharist, the holy texts, can be experienced by the Christ that they listen to, the Christ they confess. They, got, they get communion from Christ, and so they become one with his body. So that this is what Eucharist is. It's not just a, a mere ritual that we carry out without thinking about what it is for real in a deeper sense. And... Uh, the civil society, men, women, all the people that you can still call as uh, people, I mean, with the good intentions and the good will. But beyond of that, we need to reconsider the meaning of a word used by Pope John Paul II and uh, Pope Francis, and this key word is conversion. So convert. So President Balsamo mentioned that cry. Convert yourselves, because then you will have so the murder on September 15th and but before that in May, what happened? Well, something happened with uh, the Tempio della Concordia and uh, the, the deacon says, uh, so go in peace. But then uh, he had talked uh, with uh, the parents of Livatino, of Judge Livatino. And the Messiah is the one who is able to 
feel in, in the gods the pain, the suffering, the human pain, the human suffering. He feels that in his gods. And uh, Pope John Paul II greeting the deacon sees the Concordia temple, the Concord temple, and says, This is a land of culture and peace. It can't be a land of, of, of killed people. Convert yourselves. And he says it firmly. And five years ago, Pope Francis, Simo. Gioca. He, he will say the same thing, but he will say it in a different way. He will say, Mafia brothers, convert, convert yourselves. Because if you keep on like that, you will be defeated in the worst possible way. It challenges them on their own sort of territory. And we need to keep the same gut feeling when it comes to mercy. So faced with oppression and suffering and pain, we need to feel involved and engaged. And we need to engage and involve people sharing the same gut feeling. And this is the task that the Pope entrusted uh, Christian communities with in Sicily and Palermo, but uh, beyond those uh, borders. So this is a challenge, a gospel that incarnates. And we also had the death of Biagio Conte, a, a man who decided to become poor and lay because of his faith, and then he is able to mobilize so many thousands of people during his death. And so the gospel incarnates his brother, his sister, he is the person listening to the word of God and putting that into practice. Pino Pugliesi is a, a Christian, a priest that really puts into practice the message of the gospel that came down to us through history. The Archbishop of Palermo mentioned another very important figure of our city, of our country, Biagio Conte. Many of you probably heard about him, the lay missionary who decided to devote his life to the deprived brothers, the poorest ones. And he died on the very same day when Matteo Messina Denaro absconding ended. I remember that I made a report on this at uh, TV 2000, TV 2000, and I talked about the absconding period of this uh, mafia mob characterized by so many crimes and blood and violence. Instead, Biagio Conte devoted his life to the others in peace and love, and so he decided to somehow fight against the mafia in a completely different way. So on the one hand, we have a person working for the others and committing for the others, and then another person instead doing terrible things to other people. So for you, magistrates and judges, well, the work is very hard. It's an everyday struggle and challenge. So on the one hand, I mean, we have uh, police officers trying to arrest the criminals and uh, put them to trial. But on the other hand, we need to sensitize people. And uh, there is a very famous sentence by Padre Pugliesi, by Padre Pugliesi. So if each one does something, so much can be done. So to what extent 
is this key to win this battle. So to what extent is a culture committed important? Also from the church, it's very important, it's extremely important. And uh, so this is based on a, a common experience that we shared also with Salvo Tagmina and other colleagues. And uh, we immediately realized that uh, the celebration of the big trial was important, but also it was important to build a different culture, a different Sicily. So another Sicily that was so strongly supported by a person whose way of talking and uh, thinking was uh, was completely sort of similar to that carried out by Antonio Papalardo. So, uh, because the cultural element, the cultural mindset is a real game changer. And at first, the judiciary world uh, tried to give its contribution to change uh, the consciousness. And then, I mean, it uh, sort of somehow unveiled the real face of mafia to the Sicilian people. When Matteo Massina Denaro was arrested, the young people of Castel Vetrano went, took to the street wearing T-shirts saying, I see, I hear, I talk. And this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the opposite of that law of silence that uh, somehow was rife for, for so many years. The real project of uh, Father Puglisi was exactly to give young people different values with respect uh, to the values they can found in the streets. And this project is still very up to date. And we have to start from the periphery. Father Pugliese was proud to commit himself in the place where he was born and that he considered as the most forgotten neighborhood of his city. For example, I really appreciated the commitment of Monsignor Corrado Lorefice for a neighborhood that is quite at risk of becoming an off-limit area in Palermo. It is the Ballaro area. For sure you have heard this name because in this area, the Ballaro neighborhood, there is the risk that drug trafficking for many people may become the main professional business. There is another smile that I take into my heart. It is the smile of a young person. I couldn't know personally, but I saw a picture of him when he was a child. He was Giulio Zavatteri. This young man died because of crack when he was 19 years old. And my son, who is here with me, is 19 years old. So we all have to rediscover a collective commitment on the part of the institutions, but especially from those vital worlds that are civil society, the church, voluntary associations. There must be a joint effort where proximity should be our common practice. There is a great need to build a presence in the territory right at the borders in those areas that are at the margins between the state and organized crime. It is true that we haven't had uh, uh, big murders as the ones that we knew about when we were younger, but as Rocco Kinichi said, we have to be aware because the mafia has the extraordinary capacity to change continuously while remaining the same. This is one of the reasons why our position must be clear with respect to drug trafficking. We have to be really firm, no compromise, no change about this. We all know about the devastating consequences of this for young generations. <laughs> And remember, as Paolo Borsellino used to say, that the liberalization of uh, drugs would bring Italy to the margins of the civil world, of the international community. This is a commitment. This is a commitment in which 
repression must go hand in hand with proximity, with closeness to the families experiencing this tragedy, closeness to the young people that have remained uh, trapped into this uh, uh, fall, foolish uh, experience. So we can do a lot, really, we can do a lot. Oh. Time. Unfortunately, the time, the stopwatch we have here in front of us is showing that time is over. So, Salvo Tormina will make the conclusions. And my commitment was, my promise was that this meeting would be interesting. I hope we could keep this promise. And uh, another thing I wanted to say is this. by recalling the general theme of the meeting, the inexhaustible friendship. Consider the things that you have heard. You can certainly think about this figure of a priest who is a friend, who is the expression of a ecclesiastic, pastoral, cultural, social, and civic friendship. Now, this debate would uh, serve little without a follow-up, and the follow-up can only be now in the hearts and in the minds of you all. So my wish is this, may you, in the ways and in the forms that you may deem more reasonable and in prayer, become friends of Father Pugliesi. Yo. I would like to thank all the other colleagues for the intensity and the true nature of this dialogue. It is really the manifestation of a human existence that has been lived and offered as an inexhaustible friendship. What we have seen this afternoon is not uh, the devout memory of a heroic, uh, beautiful action, but it is the offer of a personal friendship that this afternoon has been expressed through the recalling of an itinerary and all the activities that uh, could be recalled in the life of uh, Pino Pugliesi, Father Pino Pugliesi. And uh, I would like to emphasize the method that has been used this afternoon. As Don Corrado, Father Corrado said that the most effective language of a narration in communication, because here we are talking about a presence and uh, the emotion of the history of a presence like Don Pugliesi, Father Pugliesi, is great as he offered his life. And uh, to conclude, I'd like to remember that uh, Livatino and this afternoon's uh, session is in continuity with the exhibition about Livatino that was present last year, which is being now brought to many uh, places, many institutes of justice, and we might have it in Palermo. Well, this is uh, the possibility to have uh, a path of knowledge thanks to the church and thanks to the presence and the history of its saints. It's a possibility for everybody, and it's a possibility for an inexhaustible friendship. It's a possibility that the meeting, that is the place where this friendship uh, manifests itself, as Pope Francis uh, mentioned in his message how many friends, uh, friendships were made in the halls of the meeting. So I would like to conclude by formulating the call to all of you who can to contribute to the donations uh, desks so that uh, this place can continue to be supported and become the opportunity to multiply the offering of this friendship. Thank you all again and have a nice evening.
la civiltà dell'amore. Fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo, più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli, perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Thank you. 